I'm Helen Glaives, and we are um, talking to Sarah Callahan, editor in chief of the data science journal Patterns, um, as part of Envry's Open Science Trek. Um, we're doing this to replace the town hall that was planned as part of EGU's General Assembly in Vienna this year. So I'm going to ask Sarah a number of questions about um, the relevance of open science to um, the journal publishing community and also how the publishing community can potentially modify their current practices to support a more open science approach. So, Sarah, I guess I'd like to start by asking you, why, would, why should we even bother making scientific research open and accessible for, for everybody rather than um, maintaining the current model that we have? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk. And uh, that's an excellent question. And I think that's one that um, goes right to the heart of why we do science in the first place. We do science to explore the universe, to discover new things, to make um, our environment and our lives better for not just scientists, but also members of the general public, everybody whose lives are touched by the science. And um, um, historically speaking, science was kept in closed communities and in subscription journals because it was hard to communicate. To communicate science, you had to write letters and those letters had to be copied and posted around and, and sent to people individually. Now we are in the lucky situation of it's so much easier to be able to transmit information across the internet and um, we are so much more globally connected. And that means that the scarcity that we had when it came to scientific communication is no longer there. Uh, so we don't have to print out things anymore and we can just send them with the click of a button via email. And I think that's really important because that allows uh, scientific knowledge to be spread far wider than just the origination community which means that other people get access to it and they can learn from it and they can use it. So scientists are not only telling other researchers about what they're doing, they're also um, using their work to help um, business people innovate or to guide policy and uh, political decision making or even to educate the next generation of future scientists. And that's why being open is so, is so really important. It's uh, spreading your influence, spreading your impact even wider. Than before. Thank you. Um, I suppose one of the things that, that I'd like to, to really sort of explore a little bit with you, Sarah, is that there's still this perception that, that open access journals lack the kudos of, of some of the other major journals that we've all heard of, those that have had the really high impact factors, and that some researchers are actually rewarded for being able to um, get their work published in these, in these very high high impact factor journals. Um, how do you think we can remove this perception and make open access more publishing fit for purpose and more widely accepted as, as having that level of visibility? I think it's really important for researchers to remember um, why they're publishing in the first place. Who are the audience they're trying to reach? Who are they talking to? That's, that's vitally important. Because if you are looking, for, looking to only communicate with a very select group of people, then you, you have to tailor your message in that way. Um, if you are looking for high impact, then you've got to start asking questions about, well, what does high impact actually mean? Um, high impact could be, yes, publishing in a high impact um, uh, impact factor journal, but it could also mean getting your research used to guide governmental policy um, and, uh, and the impact of having key input into a major political decision is is massive impact, but it's not captured by the impact factor at all. Also, as I mentioned, how do you quantify the impact of teaching and inspiring the next generation of scientists? That's something that's not captured by the impact factor. With regards to open access journals not being as impactful um, as existing journals, I can say, um, give us time. Uh, open access journals are, um, haven't been around as long as subscription journals, and impact factor does take time to, to develop and build up. Um, also, um, open access journals, we've got to remember as well, that, that fundamental thing of we are communicating to a far wider community, and we're, we're making things open because that's the way we want science to be. Science is better when it's open, standard disclaimers and a few exceptions aside. 
Thank you. So, Sarah, I think one of the, the things that we are all very aware of is the fact that the, the business models for many journals rely on, on income from their article publishing charges, their, their APCs, and, and their business model very much revolves a, around having this um, revenue stream, and, and therefore there is a continued prevalence of paywalls with many of the journals. Um, if we seek to change this model, how do you think we can we can fund open access public academic publishing going forward? What is, what is your view on that? Oh, uh, funding is always a difficult and, and contentious issue. And if it, I, I always maintain, if it was an easy problem, we would have sorted it out by now. But um, I think again, yes, it, somehow it needs to be paid for. Um, and what we need to um, really dig down to is what is the the value add that journals give to scientific communication. We are no longer looking at the physical costs of printing and distributing hard copies of books anymore, but there are other things that um, journal editors um, do um, that adds value to the whole scientific publication process. And it's things like um, managing the peer review process, for example. The peer reviewers are there, they're the experts, they are providing that quality control and checking. But the, um, the editors also provide levels of quality control and checking as well, so that um, it enables researchers who are reading the articles to go, okay, I can be confident that this, um, this article actually meets standards that I'd expect of this particular journal. It's very, very easy to publish something online, either in a preprint server or even just sticking it up on a web page somewhere. Um, but what happens then is the reader comes along and how do they know whether or not it's been peer reviewed, how they can trust it, what, how it's been checked. There's <laughs> the joy of the internet is that anyone can publish anything. The problem with the internet is because anyone can publish anything, finding things, understanding what they are, knowing um, how reliable they are is really, really difficult, and I think we've seen that a lot with the uh, with the current situation we are in, and the the, the notion of the infodemic, the um, the information that is being passed around as truth, which is founded on rumours or um, misunderstandings. And I think we will always have the need for that uh, quality control and checking, and that is where academic publishing really does come in. How we fund that is a very difficult question to answer. There are many, many different options and I don't think we really have the time to get into them on this chat, but I'd be more than welcome to hear people's comments on Twitter about them. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Sarah. And as Sarah says, if you have any views on, the, on this topic, um, on open access publishing or any of the other topics uh, that we'll be covering during our Every Open Science Trek this week, then you can join us and give us your views or ask your questions on hashtag Open Science Trek via Twitter, or you can come and visit the Envry website at www.envry.eu where you can find some more information. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.